to involve uh, the history of the area. It's going to involve some knowledge of property law. And it's going to uh, change the way that you've seen the Rancho Los Feliz, probably considerably. With respect to property law, I know that Judy Oroshnik here uh, knows one of the issues that could come up in discussing the Rancho Los Feliz. And I don't know if any of the rest of you have a background in property law. No background in property law. And I'm not going to put Judy on the hot spot, uh, but I will explain that during the uh, Spanish era, the property in California was all owned by the King of Spain. There was no property owned in fee simple. That is, when a rancho was assigned to anybody, it was assigned provisionally, which means the king could take it back at any time. Uh, that's something to know. And that kind of ownership, where you don't own the fee, is probably unheard of today. But it's called usufruct. And the kind of ownership is called usufructory ownership. Uh, I take it there's, are there any Native Americans here? Uh, I'm going to be telling uh, something about the Indians that were probably living on the rancho. And it is, of course, from the perspective of the non-Indians uh, that have done a lot of archaeological research. However, they did speak with Indian people when they prepared it. There were Gabriel Leno consultants, for instance. But by the time anybody was interested in the archaeology of Los Angeles, the Indians, yeah, it was unclear where they were living anymore. Certainly the ancient village of Yangnau had been gone for quite some time. Uh, it disappeared about 1836, and the people were moved to, to a place called Rancheria de los Poblanos. Rancheria de los Poblanos was on the Los Angeles River near the Vignes graveyards. A, about 10 years after they moved there, Rancho, uh, Rancheria de los Poblanos was confiscated by uh, a person called Juan Domingo, who happened to be married to one of the daughters of Maria Ignacia Verdugo. So if I can get through enough material, I'm going to be getting to uh, a little bit about Raimonda Feliz, the daughter, one of the daughters of Maria Ignacia Verdugo. Uh, there was, uh, I hope to get to it, there was at least one Indian village that we know of, and that was up by Ferndale. There was probably other Indian villages as well, but I have no information about that. Any historians? Yeah, amateur. I mean, I, amateur historian? Yeah, California history. California history? That's why I'm here. Pardon? That's why I am here. That's why you are here. Yeah, I How about Los Angeles history special? Well, a little bit. I mean, I've heard of the Red River Rancho Los Feliz, I read about there was a grant. I read some daughter was screwed on the property I and mean, there's a curse. Oh, that, if you could bring that all up. That, that, that's about that, it. That's as far as it goes. That's repeated in Mike Ebert's uh, Griffith Park, A Centennial History, the myth of the daughter that was screwed out of her property. That's almost entirely fake. The story? The story. Oh. Almost entirely. Oh. And Mike Ebers, in his book, says this is a legend. Yeah. That, that's, he says it's a legend. Okay. And that particular legend started with Horace Bell. Horace Bell was an attorney, Los Angeles Ranger, humorist, and person who made up an awful lot of history for the fun of it. And at the time he was writing, people 
mostly knew he was making up the history. And so it, over time, it uh, took on a reality that it hadn't had when he was writing. Okay, I guess I'm going to start now. Uh, so, so, yeah, I, uh, <laughs> so I guess that means there's no curse then? That's there is no curse. Oh. <laughs> well, I would like to welcome everyone this afternoon uh, to a, a very special presentation. It's one um, special because we have been together and since the pandemic started, so welcome back. Um, and two, because we are we just started to celebrate the 150th anniversary of Los Angeles Public Library, so this ties up perfectly with that. We have some sweat over here, also sanitizer and face masks. <laughs> Um, so thank you very much for coming on this afternoon. Uh, the Silver Lake History Collective is our co-sponsor today, and they are here. What happened to it? Filming. Uh, it's stuck. Uh, I guess we, we left it connected to that. Why is it disconnected? While they're doing, while Ronald is fooling around with the computer, it was working a few minutes ago, so hopefully it'll work again. Uh, how many of you have heard of the myth that Hugo Reed named the streets in Silver Lake? Come right back. back here. Over here. How many of you have heard the myth ah, hi, uh, that Hugo Reed named the streets in Silver Lake? You have. Do you believe it? <laughs> uh, it is extremely unlikely Hugo Reed named the streets in Silver Lake. I, I, I'm pretty sure this was developed on www.silverlake.org, uh, which is still up and still says that Hugo Reed named the streets in Silver Lake. Is it up? Yay. Uh, Hugo Reed died in 1854. He was a very important person, but not particularly with the Los Feliz area. The streets in Silver Lake were named in about 1886. He died in 1854. There were no streets in Silver Lake at the time of his death. It was a rancho owned by Maria Ignacia Verdugo. Before I go on too much longer, I have to explain who she is and what she was doing on the ranch in Los Feliz. Vicente Feliz may or may not have lived on the rancho. I believe that he did, but there is no evidence of a grant or a deed or anything saying that he owned the property. Under Spanish law, if he stayed long enough, he owned the land. But again, that is land owned in Usufruct. The king owned it until 1821. 1821, Mexico achieved independence from Spain. So of course the king no longer owned the land. And the land could be bought and sold. Before 1821, in this area, anywhere in California, anywhere in all of California, land could not be bought, sold, mortgaged, traded, or exchanged. It could be left in a will, and if it was left in a will, it could only go to the children, and if it went to the children, they also owned, they also owned the land in usufruct, meaning the king owned the land, until 1821. 1821 was independence from Mexico. That for the brief period there, this area was occupied by Mexico, which was 1821 until the first American invasion, which was in 1846. In that period of time, uh, the government and the laws changed three, four, or five times. The, uh, even in Mexico, they kept having revolutions during this time. And in California, there were very important changes. 
One, one of the changes in, that occurred after independence was that it was no longer illegal to trade with foreigners. When it was no longer illegal to trade with foreigners, rancheros and rancheras, and Maria Ignacia was a ranchera, uh, could uh, sell or trade their cattle hides. Cattle hides were called California's banknotes. There was almost no cash. They had uh, uh, brandy called aguardiente, and they had cattle hides. Uh, almost needless to say, a lot of people drank a lot of brandy because there was a time when they could not eat a lot of beef. There, they had gardens, they had agriculture. Los Angeles County at one time, and even the city of Los Angeles, was one of the most flourishing agricultural regions in the world. And the, the, known for the grapes, the vineyards, the wines, the fruits, uh, the first olive trees were planted in 1802 by Indians, and the first vineyards in Los Angeles were planted about the same time, 1802, 1804. I don't know where they were planted in Los Angeles, and I don't know if there were any vineyards planted in the Rancho Los Feliz. Maria Ignacia Verdugo, was uh, born on the east side of the river. Her father was Jose Maria Verdugo. He was one of the first grantees of Rancho Land. He got the Verdugo Ranch on the other side of the river, which has Glendale, Atwater, uh, up parts of Burbank, uh, and there was a dispute over some of the area, but it was a very large area of land, uh, now known mostly as the Glendale area. And where I first grew up, I was born in Hollywood at Cedars, which is now that blue building there. But I grew up in Glassell Park, uh, which was developed by Andrew Glassell, who got it from Julio Verdugo, the son of Jose uh, Maria Verdugo. Uh, Julio lost it, and I haven't paid too much attention to why he lost it, but he did. And Andrew uh, Lassell got it. His partner was named Chapman, and my family's first house was on Chapman Street, right behind Forest Lawn. That was on the Verdugo Ranch over there. That's where Maria Ignacio was born. She married a, a cousin once removed, maybe twice removed. I've had to ask other people to explain what once removed and twice removed means. Uh, since I have my DNA done, I, I get notices that I have people who are once and twice removed cousins. I'm not sure what they are, but it was a cousin. And his name was Juan Jose Anastasio Feliz. He was not descended from Vicente Feliz. In 1828, Maria Ignacia and her husband came up from San Diego, where her husband had been stationed, and moved out to the Rancho Los Feliz. I don't know where they lived on the rancho, but I believe they probably lived where the old ranch house was, and I hope to get to show you a picture of the old ranch house. Uh, the old ranch house could not have been built as early as 1828 because it had a roof and a chimney and no houses that had a roof and a chimney. Um, she had 13 children. Some of them died. Uh, she got cattle. She had 200 uh, head of cattle given to her in 1828 when she moved on the rancho by her godfather, Manuel Nieto, who also owned a rancho. 
Manuel Nieto was mulatto, which is, uh, means he was a mixture of African and uh, Caucasian. So that's who she is. And it's not very complicated about why she was a Verdugo owned, the Rancho Los Feliz. It's because women at that time were allowed to keep their uh, maiden names. So most of the women did keep their maiden names. I haven't come across a woman from that era that did not keep her maiden name. So Maria Ignacia Verdugo was married to Juan Jose Anastasio Feliz, a relative of uh, Vicente Feliz. How many of you know who Vicente Feliz was? You heard of him? Okay. V have you heard of the Amsa expedition? Okay. The Juan Batista de Anza expedition brought over 200 settlers, many horses. Part of the expedition brought uh, cattle, and the cattle came up later with uh, uh, an officer called Moraga, and the rest of them came through on the old road, later called El Camino Viejo, but all the roads in California were old roads. All the roads had been established by Indians. The Spanish did not hack their way through Chaparral. They came on roads that had been well used for many, many years. Extremely doubtful whether it's 1.1 sitting here or anything. Uh, if you turn the lights off, maybe, is, will that be better? Okay. This vague impression was an accident. It came with the uh, the app, whatever that thing is. Through it, it looks kind of vaguely hilly, and this is appropriate because our knowledge of that time, our knowledge of this place, is vague. The area was hilly. It was. It had more hills than it has now, and there was a road going through it. The road going through it was the most important. It was the most important road in the area. It came from the village of Yangna. The, the road crossed the river, went to the village of Yangna. Yangna, at, at that time when the Spanish arrived, was where the plaza is in front of the church. It went up, and one branch went to uh, Boca de Santa Monica, one branch went towards Cuenca, and one went, branch went into the what became the Rancho Los Feliz. So that road was very important for a very long time. And it was a very important road during the American era as well. Uh, in 1850 or 1851, the Los Angeles Board of Sessions declared, declared it was the Camino Publico or the Camino Real. Later on, uh, something I'm not going to get into, the Daughters of the Golden West decided the Camino Real was somewhere else other than where it was, but it went through the Los Feliz Rancho. Where, and it went right about here, right where this library is. Uh, the road went, Silver Lake and Ivano Reservoirs are on top of part of it. Echo Park Lake is on top of part of that old road. And it came and it went, swung around a hill, and then went to uh, a road. The only remnant of it is Rowena Avenue. Rowena Avenue is the only part of the old road, the root of the old road, that still exists. Everything else has been disturbed, everything else has been changed. Uh, if the rancho was a place that probably we would be lost for a while 
uh, before we could find where we were because the roads are not the same, nothing is the same.
tell, there's almost nothing there. Some of you are aware of the fact that uh, part of Glendale was called uh, Tropico. You can just barely see Tropico up right there. It's not working. It's not working. Uh, Tropico, I don't know. That's where the train station is today. There was a tropical train station. Right down at the bottom, you can see this dense cross hatching. That's the Southern Pacific Railroad uh, train yard and uh, station, and that's now the area called the Cornfield, or the Los Angeles State Historic Park. As you, as you may be able to see, development was very light. There was a little in Echo Park, a little Echo, Echo Park area. Um, it just, I just moved it off, so I'll look at this next one. Uh, this is a picture in the, from the 1920s showing what had happened to the river. Ah, this is what had happened to the river by the 1920s. By the 1920s, the river was dead. This is the train, the train crossed the river. The train still crosses the river. The reason the train crosses the river is because that hill I showed you in an earlier picture came right down to the edge of the river even before it was put into the concrete channel. This is the house always called the Old Ranch House. 
And as you can see, this there was an old shed or old shack attached to the house. William Mulholland, in 1886, lived in an old shack at this uh, location, according to his granddaughter's biography of him. So he probably lived in that shack. He lived with the Felice family and uh, probably with the Garcia family, one of uh, Maria Ignacia's granddaughters, Rafaela, married a fellow named Garcia, and uh, the son, Ernest Garcia, was living on Rowena Avenue, very near the uh, Little Pine restaurant. And he said that when he was little, he met Mulholland at this house where Mulholland was uh, a tenant. So the Mulholland Bridge is where the old ranch house is. This is another picture, one uh, Mark Wanamaker, who wrote about River Park, has allowed me to use it. This is. Uh, the house as it was falling apart. From the little girl's dresses, my guess is it was about the 1920s that uh, little girls were photographed in what remained of the house. Now, I, I, I said the roof was steep and it had a chimney. Those were not the usual building materials or architectural design uh, in the Mexican and Spanish eras. But you can also see the inside of the house was adobe. There is another house which is probably uh, painted, it was painted by the same woman, Mrs. Fennis. So probably the same time in 1916. There's an old adobe on the rancho. Uh, this is the area opposite the merry-go-round where the ranger station is, and the rebuilt ranger station it was this house. It was not built until the American era. Uh, the very different archivists from different libraries say it was built by different people. My guess it was Antonio, Jose Antonio Feliz, who was the oldest son of Maria Ignacia Rodrigo. This is much later than my period of 1843. I ended this in 1843. Uh, three years later, the Americans would invade Los Angeles. 1847, uh, Andres Pico and John C. Fremont would sign a treaty. Neither of them had any authority to do that, but it ended the war and it ended the invasion of Los Angeles. You can see this as a map of a place that exists. It did not exist. It existed on paper. It has two reservoirs that you might be able to see. This reservoir is the Rowena Reservoir. This is Rowena. It was there. This was another street, which I can't, it would stop. They call it Woodstock up here. That's going to end up being Waverly Drive. And you may be able to see this train track that goes through it. That was real. That existed. That was the train track that went to Griffith W. Uh, J. Griffith's ostrich farm uh, in Griffith Park. People used to take the train, which was built about 1886 through here. The rest of the area that we call Silver Lake, some of this Las Feliz area, Griffith J. Griffith, all of that stuff, the reservoir did not exist, but it's down as if it does. Uh, all of this stuff existed on paper only. It was called a paper town. There were many, many paper towns in Southern California uh, after the railroad came through. Many, many people decided to become wealthy. Griffith may not have named the streets. It was probably the subdevelopers that named it. What's a paper town? 
A paper town is a town that exists on paper only. Oh. And Ivanhoe was one of them. There, there was only a handful of houses here in 1886, and they had existed before the subdivision map. This is uh, a detail from a drawing or a painting uh, of what was called the Boulevard Tract. The artist was standing on uh, this big hill in Forest Lawn. I think it's the one with the building with the cross on it. You can see everywhere. So the artist was standing on this hill, looking down. You can see the Los Angeles River uh, as it was then in 1886, turning around, turning around what was Griffith Park coming through here. Up at the top, uh, this writing didn't happen, but there's a little conglomeration over there, right there. That was the ostrich farm. And if you look in the middle, you can see the little tiny train with smoke coming out of it. That was the ostrich farm railway. And it came through the gap, and the gap was called by the Spanish, well, for a brief time, it was called by the Spanish, the Portisuelo, which was an archaic word, uh, a hybrid of Spanish and Latin. Any questions about this picture, by the way? Can you see what they were doing? What it is a picture of? So, so that is the eastern boundary of, of the uh, ranch? The ranch was the river. The eastern boundary of the right. ranch was the river, yes. And she was born on the east side, right? And she was born on the east side, yeah. Okay. So what did he do with ostriches? I mean, was there a market for ostriches? Or? There was a big market for ostriches. Okay. And what also, happened to that market? Uh, well, for one thing, ostrich, ostrich plumes, hats. Oh, that's those, true. Yeah. Those big hats. There was a big market for them. People used to, uh, there were several ostrich farms in Los Angeles. Oh. And uh, people used to uh, ride carriages through what would be Silver Lake, through Echo Park, and up uh, to visit the ostrich farm. In the meantime, Griffith and other uh, spec land speculators tried to sell land to people that were there. Is, is the rail line the same line that the subway is? No. 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 Uh, that is Griffith Park Boulevard. No. Right. That's you want to know the question? Oh, yeah. I was just can you repeat the question so oh, everybody? No, I was going to ask that something before you change the slide. But um, I was wanting to know if you could tell us why the river was choked off in one of the slides, and now this one it's much more. Well, this is 1886. Okay, okay. The other one was in the 1920s. And they put the cement in. In, in uh, well, beginning in the 30s, but in different areas at different times. I've read that the Glendale Narrows uh, was the place where it was first constructed. But as you can see, it has a soft bottom in the Glendale Narrows. And it's one of two or three places with a soft bottom. So trees and plants which are festooned with plastic are now at the bottom of the uh, river where it goes through the Glendale Narrows. They also, she also claimed the land, the river behind, uh, behind her, to I think, I believe, I believe Barnum. These, this is a picture of H.H. H. Bancroft. H.H. H. Bancroft wrote, wrote most of the material that we have today about the history of California. He came here for the gold rush, made nothing. He became a bookseller, made a fortune. People were starved for anything that was written. And he hired uh, researchers, among them Thomas Savage, who came down and interviewed people in Los Angeles. They had every single document that it was possible to have at that time, and they hand copied them. Those copies he sold to the Bancroft Library at UC Berkeley in 1905, which is extremely fortunate because in 1906, 
San Francisco experienced an earthquake and a fire, and everything burned. Almost all of the original documents are gone, having burned in the uh, fire. So most of the research on California was begun by Hubert Howe Bancroft, and you can look him up online. All of his books are online. Another very important historian was uh, Herbert Bolton. Bolton was born in the Midwest and worked his way through college, came to UC Berkeley as a professor, and taught uh, the Spanish borderlands history. Before that time, the perspective was entirely an East Coast perspective of Americans, English-speaking people, coming across the country seeking democracy and seeking land. His perspective was that this was a multicultural country and that there were different people, although he rarely touched on the Indians, and that uh, the Spanish borderlands should be taken into consideration. The Spanish borderlands were essentially all the lands owned or claimed by Spain that were uh, uh, in what is today the United States including Florida. This gentleman, James Miller, Gwynn, is the tall fellow in front of the American flag at a 4th of July party at Westlake Park in, uh, I forget, I think it's 1915. So as you can see, he's taller than everybody else there. J.M. Uh, Gwynn is the person most relied on for history, and most of his history was taken from Bancroft, except for the period he lived through. Most of his history is distortions of Bancroft, twisting of Bancroft, and just making up stuff. He made up a lot of stuff. <laughs> he was the Los Angeles uh, School District Superintendent, and he'd been the Anaheim School District uh, superintendent before then. He's responsible for a lot of misunderstandings. Another area I'd just likely going to touch on is what uh, has been called the fantasy past of Southern California. Helen Hunt Jackson wrote a book called Ramona and her Indian husband was Alessandro. Actually, that's a misspelling. I misspelled it because the street here in this area is called, spelled Alessandro, and but pronounced Alessandro, and this misspelling keeps coming up. It probably came from this enormously popular book uh, written called Ramona. There were three films made of Ramona. Um, and the point of the story had been to show the plight of Indians in Southern California, but it was interpreted in a completely different way. It was interpreted to mean that the mission padres were benign and that the Indians suffered, well they did, and uh, that the uh, rancho life was exuberant and wealthy, which sometimes it was and sometimes it was not. And as a result, a myth about California uh, arose about very wealthy people living in huge haciendas, the story of Zorro, all that kind of stuff uh, grew out of the Ramona story. This is from the silent movie of uh, Ramona. This is Horace Bell, who made up the story of the curse on the Ranch of Las Vegas. Um, I have found from genealogical read records that there was a Petra Feliz, father unknown, who was born on the Rancho Las Vegas in 1835 and lived with her mother. Her mother was widowed in 1836. Her grandfather was Francisco Feliz 
Francisco Feliz was a son of Vicente Feliz. Uh, her great grandfather was Vicente. She did have a claim to the rancho before 1843, but it was through her grandfather, Francisco, who made no claim to the rancho. So it's possible that she was upset, uh, that Petra was upset, but she wasn't a daughter of Vicente Feliz or a relative. Uh, she was a great granddaughter of his, and uh, she really had no claim. Okay, Vicente, this is the uh, brief biography of him. He was a member of the Juan Batista de Anza expedition. His wife was the only woman to die, the only person to die. She died in childbirth on the trail. Uh, he had five children who stayed in Los Angeles or at the Mission San Gabriel. He camped with the others in the expedition in the Puerto Suelo. And from measuring it, it is prop the campsite probably was under the Silver Lake Reservoir on February 21st, 1776. One of his grandchildren was born in Los Angeles, probably on the ranch out because there's no other place to live in, in 1780. He was one of the soldier escorts that brought the Pope Lodoris to Los Angeles in 1781. In 1786, he assigned house lots and farm lots to the Pope Lodoris. And he was literate. He and, uh, and Jose Arguello were the two uh, people who prepared the documents for the Pope Lodoris and who drew the first map of uh, Los Angeles in 1786. In 1787, he became the Comisionado. The Comisionado at that time had the authority to grant property within the Pueblo to settlers. He remained Comisionado until 1800. He died in Santa Barbara in 1809. There is no record of a deed or a grant of any land to be sent. An 1816 census reported that he had been given a rancho and had given two of his sons sitios. Sitios are grazing land on the lake by one lake. The census, by the way, is at the Autry Research Center. A copy of it, a little, little tiny print. This is Maria Ignacio Verdugo's 1843 decennial. And it is very difficult to understand most of the decennials were very difficult to understand, but it's possible to make out some of what she was doing. At the bottom, you can see uh, Lindero, uh, Rio del Pueblo. Lindero, Rio del Pueblo was the Los Angeles River where it went through the Glendale Narrows. You can see Laguna del Potrero, which is up there, it looks like the sun. That was the, became under the Americans as Crystal Springs uh, water development, where a lot of the water was taken to feed Echo Park Lake, which before that was reservoir number four. She drew a flat roofed house with a fence around it. She drew another house with hatch lines through it. I believe the house with the hatch lines through it was the house she did not claim. And I believe that was Francisco's house. So her house was probably, as best I can make out, in the area of the Mulholland Fountain. Obviously, this is not the scale. The scale at the bottom says it's a scale of a Mia, and nothing in there corresponds. Maybe the line across the top corresponds to something uh, that that scale corresponds to. There's a compass rose up at the top, and it's unclear what directions it's pointing to. I think it just drew it there because it thought it should be there. But it doesn't point north, south, east, west, or anything that can be made up. There is a uh, border, Lindero del Arastrado, right, uh, excuse me, Arastadero. And the Arastadero was probably the place where they took the bulls 
and took the hides off of the, bell, uh, the um, bulls and put them on ox cars to take them to San Pedro. The Arrastadrero itself was at the bottom of where Echo Park Lake is today, uh, about where the freeway is, as best as I can figure out. And that was where the road went, entered the hills into what became the Rancho Los Feliz. This is Raimonda Feliz. It's the only photograph I found of a uh, member of Maria Verdugo's family. And she married Juan Domingo, who was either Dutch or German. Ergo, her very tall son, uh, Torio, who's standing next to her. She also had about 13 children. And the stories about her are largely untrue. Uh, but they threw the Indians off of uh, Rancheria de los Poblanos and established a vineyard there. This is an early map of uh, the rancho. There was a terrible dispute between Los Angeles, the city of Los Angeles, and Maria Ignacia's uh, rancho Los Feliz, because the rancho was actually within the Pueblo boundaries. It was owned by the people of the city of Los Angeles when Governor Mitchell Terina granted it to her in 1843. <clears throat> this was pointed out to him several times and he ignored it, and he granted her the rancher. In the American era, they shrunk the city land to one league by one league. It is that square area in the right. I obviously can't use technology at all. <laughs> the, uh, use the cursor. Ah, uh, this. This big side of this rancho uh, is the Pueblo land, and it cut into the former rancho. This is the river going through the narrows. This is where it went on the top. This is a Encino and Nopalero. Anyone know what that means? It, Encino was oak, it was an oak tree, and Nopales are the fruit of a certain kind of uh, cactus, prickly pear. And prickly pear was the area over here. And the name for prickly pear today is Hollywood. So this was where Hollywood began. And she went to, I figured it out before, past, past Western uh, in Hollywood. What was it called before? No palero. No. No palero. No palace of the fruit on the cactus. Oh, on the prickly pear. And so they drew lines from there to there. She called the, this line Lindero de la Brayeta on her. Let me go back. On her decennio, uh, she had Lindero de la Brayeta. Nobody knows what Brietta means. Uh, I've, I've contacted everybody with the expertise that I can find, and as far as I can figure out, she probably meant Brea and Ita, meaning it was probably a reference to an oil seep. There was a tremendous amount of oil that went through. So the Los Angeles oil field, where you know we found the oil, is below Elysian Park, but there are there were oil wells all over Los Angeles. So that area is a little ambiguous, and I'm not positive what she meant by it. You can see right there at the corner, right there, Porzuelo. The, the Americans didn't know how to spell Puerzuelo, so they said Puerta Suelo, which means door, sole of the shoe. Mm -hmm. In Glendale, they named Julio Verdugo's uh, place Puerto Suelo, 
which means something like, I carry dirt. The city of Glendale considered the possibility of naming Glendale, I carry dirt, which would have been interesting uh, today. But this is the Portisuela, and the Portisuela does not come up well here, but this was the, where the road went through from the Mulholland, from where the Mulholland Fountain is, through the gap, a longer arena, and then down into a long valley, and the long valley extended to uh, Echo Park Lake. So it was all of one big valley, but the larger valley was the lake where the two reservoirs are now. This is Manuel Dominguez, who owned the Domingo Rancho. He was the one who did a lot of paperwork. He was prefecto and involved in uh, Maria Ignacio's brain. He also pointed out, he also went around the Rancho measurement, which was impossible, but he did it uh, without knowing what the center of the Rancho was, just saying where she said it was. And he did this by having a leather rope that he put together. Ah, this is Governor Emanuel and Katrina who granted, who granted the rancho to uh, Maria Ignacio Verdugo. Shortly after that, in the second so-called battle of the Puente Pass, he was driven out of Los Angeles, got on a ship, and left. Topographic map about 19, around early 1900 of the Glendale Narrows. It's sort of like you're looking down on the Glendale Narrows. This is the river, and you can see those two hoops of land, the two hoops that where Frog Town is today. This, this is the river. This was all marshy area. This is why people didn't build. When they had good sense, they didn't build in the river area in the Glendale Narrows. The Glendale Narrows was deeper than it was on the Las Vegas side, which is why most people crossed the river either uh, on the top of Las Vegas Rancho, uh, where the, supposedly is a river, but it's just a concrete channel. And they also crossed down below, down below, over here, they crossed the river. That was because here, it was deep, and it ran very, very fast. And it ran deep because it was fed by uh, uh, this waterway through Tahanga that came down from the mountains. The mountains in those days, the San Gabriel Mountains were full of snow. Uh, it was a different climate, and the snow uh, fed the Los Angeles River from the San Diego Mountains. Also, there was bedrock under here, and because of the bedrock, the river was shoved upwards. There are two rivers. The Los Angeles River is two rivers. One of them is subterranean, and because it's subterranean, it uh, used to come up in springs. One of the springs was in Echo Park. It was at Baxter Valentine. Another spring was near Marshall, and another spring was at uh, Fargo and Glendale Boulevard by the church there. And there were probably other springs because the water just came up in various places from the subterranean river and flowed over Los Angeles feeding different projects over time. Is there anything else? I have uh, written all of this stuff out, so if you want to look up this map, it's really interesting. You can see just a couple of little developments there. These, on top of Legion Park is the line. You see the line on top of Legion Park? Mm -hmm. I'm not doing this again right there. This line, this line. These were all the unbroken hills. I was astonished to find out 
that people couldn't get through. But they could not get through, and you can see it in this topographic map, until the early, sometime early in 1900. This is EOC, or it's Plan de la Ciudad de Los Angeles. Uh, he did it with William Rich Hutton, a young engineer and surveyor. To survey things, they dragged chains, of engineering chains, very heavy chains, over hills, over waterways, over everything else. You can see the, uh, the this is El Camino Viejo, the old road. The branch to the left goes to Santa Monica. The branch in the middle goes to Cuenca. And that branch up there, up here, this is the branch that went through the Arrastadero into the uh, Rancho Las Vilas. And these were the hills. Now, I'm not sure I understand how this works, but the uh, this was the uh, Arreo de los Reyes, it went through Pershing Square, down here, and the road uh, went skirted right by there as well. This is about where the subway building is downtown. So this is how they are. And that was the very, very old road. This is the road created in 18, uh, this is the, me, this is Echo Park Lake, but this started as Reservoir Number 4, which was created out of waterways uh, flowing from Baxter, Glendale Boulevard, and um, uh, Crystal Springs on Phoenix Rancho. And this is, or Spangler's picture of Echo Park in 2020, Echo Park Lake. Behind the lady in the lake, you can see almost directly to the south is Bunker Hill. You can see the, you know, the skyscrapers on Bunker Hill behind the lady in the lake. So you get an orientation of Echo Park Lake is almost exactly uh, south of Silver Lake and uh, uh, Ivanhoe Reservoirs. This was the creek when it went downtown and it came off of Bunker Hill. You can just see this little, little lake, little, to me, little waterway. This is from a it's called the Bird's Eye View. It's the Library of Congress. It's a detail from that map. The, if you want to spend hours trying to figure out where things are, just look at the Library of Congress, Bird's Eye Views of Los Angeles. This is a detail from the William Hammond Hall topographic map of Los Angeles. And I have drawn the Camino Real as a uh, Camino Viejo, as it was in 1880. Next to the red line, you can see the lake with a little island in it. In 1880, the road went around Angelino Heights. Given the diaries and what people wrote in the diaries of uh, Father Font and Juan Batista de Anza, the measurements that they provided, I believe that there was no lake, no arroyo, no canyon, no gulch in the 18th century, and the people went right through it, making that road shorter. But up at the top, you can see it's going across uh, Romina, along Romina, and into Griffith Park. Oh, can anyone get this up front? Can you get this? Oh, I guess not. Is there a way to get this to go up? This is low. You have to scroll up. I, I, I can't scroll up. 
to think, okay, well, unfortunately this did not come across well. This is a beautiful painting, 1873, by Hermann Herzog, who was a German tourist, came through and he painted this. Uh, you can just barely see, unfortunately, because it doesn't show up well, a little bit of blue. A little bit of blue was the lake that was in the uh, the Portis Willow, what they were calling the Portis Willow. The Portis Willow is the, the valley, and the Ivanhoe and some of the reservoirs are in the valley. You can see a little bit of blue, but not very much. I don't know who the White House is belongs to, uh, and I can't figure out where it was that he was standing. But that big lump of a hill over to the left, that was Griffith Park. I mean, as it looked, not Griffith Park, Mount Lee next to Griffith Park. That showed up in this drawing. That big bump no longer exists. Max said it lowered that hill because he was planning a development there, which didn't happen because of the depression. Too bad. You can see right in the middle, uh, there is something like a, this up. Uh, see this mountain right here? The 210 goes across it now. This is the San Gabriel Mountains behind there. This is that mountain, hmm. shaped like a triangle, that you can see. This is from the dam. This, is, this picture is taken from the dam. Until they opened the dam to the public, it was not possible for most people to get this perspective, so that you can see how much light this, this is. This is Silver Lake, the, this is from UC Riverside uh, collection. This is uh, the dam, it was a reinforced clay dam that obviously has been rebuilt uh, since then, uh, that Mala Holland had built in 1904. They didn't flood the lake into somewhat after some time. And this is looking, as you can see, in 1904, if you're looking from the east side to the west side, you can see what the development was like in that area in 1904. Nothing. This is a shot of Buster Keaton in the film, silent film, Hard Luck. Hard Luck was fil uh, filmed in 1921, and the lake, as you can see, did not have was not in a concrete basin. It was one lake. The two lakes, the two reservoirs, occurred at a later time. You can also see the same hills that were greener in 1904 uh, now look like they are dry. This is on YouTube, Hard Luck, and it's about I think it's about eight minutes. I think it's about eight minutes into the film that you can see it. So anytime you want to look at it, I think that you can see what the lake looked like back then. What was the name of the film? Hard Luck. Oh, okay. It's a Buster Keaton film. Um, it's dark humor and it's great. This is a 1922 map of this area. As you can see in 1922, people have started to uh, build in there. And you can see that there is a line uh, that the, uh, the street called Ivanhoe at that time. And again, it's only one lake as late as 1922. Uh, that there's a line that goes across the river. So now there are two ways to get across the river. But actually, that line that says it's brand, it goes across its brand, that was the uh, red car. There was not a bridge at that place in 1922. And there should be a bridge, a Hyperion bridge, about that time, but it's not showing up. 
It's not our Hyperion bridge that you're all used to. The Hyperion on this map maybe took a while. This was Hyperion. It ended in this little thing that looked like a chair. This little thing that looked like a chair was uh, an exit from two tunnels that went beneath Waverly Drive. That was as late as 1922. In 1923, they are going to excavate that, and they're going to excavate Fletcher Drive. There's no Fletcher Drive to show you. It didn't exist. There was no opening. They created the opening, uh, you know, by Astros. You can barely see this, but there's a little ruin on an old tract in 1885. The, uh, it was owned by a Mormon uh, farmer, Jesse Hunter, who bought up a lot of property in the area. And on his rancho was a little ruin. So you, to see it, it was very tiny. To see it, you would have to go to the Huntington Library website and look up Jesse Hunter's tract, and then flip it. I have flipped it so that you can see it because the surveyor did it the other way around. You can't figure out where anything else is. I think this is the house that what was the ruin in 1885. The hills behind the house are still intact. You can see the San Gabriel Mountains. I have seen that sharp thing in the San Gabriel Mountains, uh, both from Echo Park Lake and from standing on the back of the dam. So it's this, this is about approximately where the library is. It's in the area of where this library is today. Uh, maybe closer to Astro and the hills still in Brooklyn were behind it. Interestingly, there's a pine tree at one end. I don't know that the pines grew here, but by 1852, there was one. This is Charlie Chaplin in uh, Tilly's Poetry Romance in 1814. In 1814, he's standing on what would be Glendale Boulevard, and there are telephone poles set up there and there's a road now going over the hill behind him in, in 1914. In 1904, Ed, Elsie Brand, uh, blasted open what was called Hard Luck Hill to create the, the uh, line later named Pacific Electric Line to Glendale. So this is sometime after 1904. The first time I saw this picture, I said, a fragmented metropolis by Ferguson. I said, oh, I wish you could live there, without realizing I did. <laughs> so that, looking down towards Frogtown and San Diego Mountains. This was the, this is going to be Fletcher Drive. Fletcher Drive is going to go under this castle. And as far as I can figure out, a hill is missing from this one. So this is when it had a wooden trestle and it crossed up the river later on. And this is after there was a metal, uh, a metal insert put in the middle to support the, the, the Viaduct, and you can just see some horizontal lines in the right of the, of the picture. That's Fletcher Drive, and it goes through to Riverside Drive. Over at the top, is this going to happen? Over here, where? Over here. There's a vanilla cone and a chocolate cone. That was Curry's Mile High ice cream, right there. And uh, I think this is that burger restaurant across the street where there's a gas station. And Curry's, if you stand up on Waverly Drive and look down, you can
can see that the old Curry's ice cream store is inside the structure uh, occupied by the Ivanhoe restaurant today. Uh, this is Roger Rabbit, and uh, he's riding Benny the Cab with Eddie Valiant in the film Who Framed Roger Rabbit, part of which was shown on the uh, Hyperion Bridge. So he's looking towards the Hyperion Bridge. You can see the park in the background, and they are looking in the direction of the Fletcher Drive Bridge. So. Um, Salon Canyon. Uh, 1860. 
Why is it? Why is it? I mean, besides being old, why is it called historic? I don't know long? why they call it historic. Long old old is historic. <laughs> old is historic. Yeah, I guess. I mean, yeah. Um, uh, Solano Canyon was developed in 1860. It does connect to what I'm saying because if that area, all of that area, Elysian Park, were called donation lots. When the city finally got its land back from the, some of its land back from her, uh, Maria Ignacia, um, it had a whole lot of acres of land. It gave away 80% of its land. This is one of the reasons this is an important thing to understand. It gave away 80% of its land. So back to the rancho again, when Manuel Vitorina granted parts of Los Angeles to a private individual, a very deserving individual, but there were still parts of Los Angeles, and it was still illegal when he gave it to her. He gave the common lands as well. Los Angeles, according to Spanish law, was supposed to be surrounded by common lands. The river was supposed to be commonly owned by everybody, in trust for everybody. The common lands with the forests around it, that was supposed to be the common lands for everybody. When Manuel Mitchell Torina granted it to a private individual, he erased the ejidos, uh, the common lands, and they were never heard from again. When the Americans took over, they gave away or sold very cheaply 80% of the land that they owned. They continue to have a very, the city government continues to have at least an antagonistic approach to commonly owned lands. Um, in the story of Chavez Ravine is probably known to most of you. That land had been land Marie Nashia claimed. The city got it back. Then the city got it back a second time to build public housing through using its power of eminent domain. And it sold that land to Walter O'Malley for a ballpark, and it built a road through the park for Walter O'Malley's ballpark. There has been a long tradition of the city of having an antagonistic relationship to land that is held in trust for all of the people that live here. Uh, in slums, no, they just do it. They just do it. It's because of the ideology. It's because of the ideology that private ownership, private ownership is better uh, than public ownership. They really believe that. The people in the city believe it. There are developer lobbyists. That doesn't mean anybody's been bribed. I don't think they've been bribed. Maybe. Um, in this particular area, uh, two stairways have been closed. The Fargo stairways, that's municipal land. The Westerly stairways, that's municipal land. Those are municipal streets. Up the Hathaway development, the city illegally closed four city streets so that there could be a uh, gated community. Do we have a random time? Oh, no, it's like four ish. Yeah. Oh, it's four ish? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Arthur. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.